HP the Lion Tamer PT-1. Harry Potter sat staring at the wall of the hospital wing, absently patting the coarse fur of the giant black dog curled at his side. It was only the second night since the living nightmare that had been the final task of the Triwizard Tournament and the resurrection of the most feared Dark Wizard of all time. Harry's right arm twinged a bit where he'd been cut by Wormtail, and Harry flexed his fingers reflexively at the momentary pain. The dog eyed Harry mournfully, and gave the slightest whine of sorrow. Harry either didn't hear it, or was too lost in his own thoughts to respond to it. He just kept absent-mindedly continue to stroke the dog's black coat. Harry had been left with an overwhelming amount of questions as to what was going to happen. He had witnessed firsthand the adamant denial by Cornelius Fudge that it simply could not be true. There was no way that Lord Voldemort could have come back from the dead. People do not come back from the dead. Especially the single most feared wizard in all of history. It just wasn't possible. Except that they lived in a world of magic, and Voldemort had not truly died. Harry hoped that Fudge was just in denial, and that once the shock wore off, the minister would begin taking steps to stop what Harry feared would be another war. In the meantime, it actually made Harry feel a bit of comfort to know that Dumbledore took the threat seriously, and had immediately dispatched people to begin organizing. Harry tore his steely gaze from the wall to look at the dog who was still watching him carefully. Dumbledore had asked Sirius to set off and notify certain individuals, but Harry had protested. He had begged for Sirius to remain with him. Both Dumbledore and Sirius looked as if they were going to try to convince him that he would be okay, but thankfully, Hermione had chosen that moment to speak up in defense of her best friend. Sirius, you need to stay with Harry. He needs his family right now. And while we're as good as family to him, you are the closest thing to a father that he has. Right now, there is nothing more important than Harry's well-being. Silence reigned for several moments, broken only by Mrs. Weasley's mumblings. Harry guessed she had been trying to figure out how it was Sirius Black, wanted mass murderer, was the closest thing to a father Harry had. In the end, Dumbledore wisely agreed with Hermione's assessment, and decided it was probably best if he himself contacted certain individuals. Besides, I can likely do it much faster than you could, Sirius. It was agreed that Sirius should remain in his animagus form while in the school, as it would not do for anyone to catch a glimpse of a wanted fugitive, especially given the events of the past day. Harry had been surrounded by his friends all day, but they had barely spoken. He loved them all, but he desperately wished to be alone, and was extremely thankful when they had all finally gone to dinner that night. The worst part of it all had been his meeting with Mr. and Mrs. Diggory that morning. Mr. Diggory looked so horrible, and broken, that Harry had tears in his eyes before anyone spoke. Harry felt a heavy guilt in his heart because he had told Cedric to take the cup with him. It should have been a Hogwarts victory, the two of them standing together, united for their school. Instead, it had been a sentencing. Cedric had died only moments after they had won the tournament for their school. Worse still was that neither of the Diggory seemed to blame him for the loss of their only child. In fact, they thanked him for returning Cedric's body to them so they might be able to say goodbye, and bury him properly. Harry had even tried to offer the Thousand Galleon prize money, but the Diggory's refused. Harry felt the sting of tears again as he remembered that horrible instant when Cedric's life was extinguished like a candle. The door to the infirmary opened, and Harry wiped at his eyes, not wishing to let anyone see him so vulnerable. A girl approached him, and Harry thought at first it might be Ginny Weasley. Certainly in the dark, it was hard to make out much. The girl was about Ginny's height, with her hair tied back in a ponytail, but when she finally reached his bedside, it couldn't have been more obvious that this was not Ginny. In fact, this girl wasn't even in Grapender. The girl had dark hair, and soft brown eyes. 
her skin was the color of cream, with the faintest smattering of freckles on her nose. But the thing that actually disturbed Harry was the silver and green insignia on her robes. This girl was a Slytherin. The dog next to Harry began growling low, which caused the girl to step back, holding up her hands defensively. Very protective dog you got there, Harry the girl said cautiously. I'm not here to make trouble, I swear. Harry patted Sirius' head reassuringly and regarded the girl for a moment. The Slytherin took a seat in the chair that Molly Weasley had barely left in the past day. I just needed to see for myself that you were okay. I knew that I'd never be allowed with all your friends around you. When I saw them all at dinner, I figured it was my best chance. Why do you care? Don't all Slytherins hate me or something? Harry asked not bothering to hide the venom in his voice. The girl looked as if she had expected it. Not all of us hate you, Harry. You actually have more than a few supporters there. We're just not vocal about it. She smiled. Why are you so interested in how I am? That's kind of complicated, and more than a little embarrassing. The girl said. Harry couldn't see in the dark, but had the feeling the girl was blushing. Sirius inclined his head and gave a low whine. There have been a lot of stories making the rounds, all of them horrible, and I just couldn't take it anymore. I had to know. Look, if you came to hear about what happened. Harry began, getting more irritated, but the girl stopped him quickly. I don't want to know. She said firmly. Whatever happened in that maze was truly horrid, I have no doubt, and I'm sure you're going to be haunted by it for a long time. I don't want to make you relieve it. As I said, I just needed to see for myself that you were okay. Harry stared at her for a long time. She began to fidget under his rather unnerving gaze. You hang out with Parkinson, right? You're green grass. Daphne will be fine the girl said, a bit softly. But I don't understand. Harry said, rubbing at his temples. I guess there really is no avoiding it. Daphne sighed. She seemed to be stealing herself before heaving a long sigh. Okay, I've kind of liked you for about a year and a half now. I don't mean the legend, or whatever they call you. I like Harry the boy who struggles to get a potion right because our teacher is a bit unfair to him. The boy who looks so bored in history class, or sticks up for the care of magical creatures professor, even when he's more than a little disturbed by the bizarre creatures himself. I like the real Harry, and I've been wanting to get to know him for a really long time. So why didn't you talk to me before? Because I'm a coward. Daphne shrugged. I said before that you have supporters in Slytherin, but there aren't many, and the ones who do try to keep it quiet. It's better for everyone that way. But not just that, you are rather unapproachable. You just put out this aura that tends to keep people away. You're kind of scary sometimes. But you're not afraid tonight? Harry asked. I'm terrified, to be honest. Daphne admitted. But you still came. I had to. I had to see with my own eyes that you were. Okay. I am. Or rather, I think I will be. Harry sighed, settling back into his pillows a bit. I don't think you're a coward, either. You don't even know me. Daphne pointed out, but Harry pressed on. Everyone gets afraid. It's how we deal with that fear that makes us brave or cowardly. Huh. Daphne said, looking impressed. That's very wise. I never thought about it that way. Well, I should let you get your rest. Daphne stood up, and began to leave, but stopped when she got to the end of his bed. Harry. Yeah. Next year. Do you think we might spend some time together? 
you know, to get to know one another. The great black dog raised its head, cocking its ears inquisitively. It looked between the two teens expectantly. Harry stared at the shadowy silhouette of the girl, who was waiting expectantly. It was the great black dog who actually made up Harry's mind. Sirius rose from the bed, and trotted lightly over the girl, nudging her hand with his muzzle. He gave the girl a little lick on her palm, and went right back to his spot on Harry's bed. The girl looked a bit questioningly at Harry who had a small smile on his face. Yeah. That'd be okay. The girl smiled and then left, leaving Harry alone with his dog. His animagus godfather gave him a rather pointed look. Oh shut up. Harry said. Harry swore he saw the dog smile before dropping his bed back on his front paws. Just as Daphne Greengrass left the infirmary, Hermione and Ron, followed by a very worried Mrs. Weasley appeared. Ron looked rather upset about something, though Harry never found out what it was, as Mrs. Weasley promptly began looking him over and fussing over him. Harry was allowed to return to Grafender Tower the very next day. Before he was released, Sirius took a few moments to let him know that it was okay to feel horrible over everything that happened, but he should not feel guilty. There is only one person to blame for all that happened, and that is not you. Sirius said as he gripped his godson's shoulders, and forced Harry to look in his eyes. I know that you think it was your fault that Cedric was even there, but you had no idea what was going to happen. You were led into a trap, and it's that simple. Harry nodded, taking his godfather's words to heart. Deep down he knew that he was not to blame, but there was still a deep sense of shame about what had transpired. Do not bottle any of this up. Sirius advised. Talk to your friends about it, or you can write me if you want. If you bottle it up, then it may end up consuming you. If you don't feel comfortable talking to Ron or Hermione, there's always that pretty little Slytherin girl. Sirius winked. Harry gave a wry look to his godfather, but promised he would talk to someone if he needed to. After Sirius left, Harry was met by his friends, and together, the three of them journeyed up to Grafender Tower. Everyone they passed along the way abruptly averted their eyes, which troubled Harry until Hermione explained it. Dumbledore told everyone to leave you alone. No one's really allowed to ask you any questions about it all. She said when a group of Hufflepuffs passed them, quickly looking away. When they got back to the common room, Harry left his friends and went to his dorm, where he lay on his bed. School would be letting out in a day, and Harry began anticipating his return to the Disleys. I can't believe you actually did it. Tracy Davis was sitting on her bed in the Slytherin fourth year girls dorm. Her best friend, Daphne Greengrass was finishing packing her trunk in preparation for returning home the next day. Daphne was a very pretty girl with straight dark brown hair, and soft brown eyes. She was slim, and lithe with a developing dancer's figure. It's been two days, Tracy. Daphne sighed. Get over it. But you actually talked to him. Tracy said, waving her hands for effect. You talked to Harry Potter? Yes. Daphne said, turning to face her friend. I talked to him, and he was very nice and hopefully next year I'll talk to him more. So what are you going to do? Tracy asked. What do you mean? Well, now you've made contact. What comes next? How much time are you going to allow to pass before you snog him senseless? Tracy asked, a very mischievous smile on her face. Oh my god. Daphne shrieked turning to stare incredulously at her friend. I don't even know what I'm going to say to him when I see him next. It took me a year just to talk to him once, and you've got me snogging him like we're star-crossed lovers already. Maybe you are. Tracy shrugged, smiling suggestively. 
and maybe we're not. I want to take this slow. I want to get to know him. The real him. Right now, I have to let him see past the fact I'm in Slytherin. Then we'll see. But you'd like to snog him. At this, Daphne couldn't help the small smile that appeared, which made Tracy laugh hysterically. The final day of term went by just as it had for many, many years. All over the castle, students said goodbye to friends, fearing they might not get a chance on the train. Packing their trunks, or just wandering around the grounds. In the afternoon, Harry and his friends went down to Hagrid's hut to visit, and bid him goodbye for the year. During their visit, Hagrid praised Harry for his efforts in the tournament, and what happened in the graveyard. Harry's mood darkened a bit until Hagrid compared him with his father. Yeah did as much as your father would have done, and I can think of no higher praise than that. The memory of seeing the shadows of his parents' spirits gave Harry a very warm feeling in his chest. The Great Hall was filled once again with all the students from Hogwarts and both Bose Batons and Durmstrang for the leaving feast. The feast had begun earlier than normal, as at the end, both of the visiting schools were scheduled to leave. Dumbledore ended the feast with a very heartfelt speech about the importance of unity and friendships, and gave a warning of dark times ahead. Unfortunately for everyone, his speech was far too vague for many to understand, and the message behind it went unheeded. There were many goodbyes that night, as the visiting schools bid farewell to the new friends they had made. Victor Crumb made a point in asking Hermione to write to him the Bulgarian seeker then came to Harry and bowed low. Uvir forced into this tournament, and even though Uvir not ready for it, you showed everyone what we can accomplish if we truly wish it. It was fixed, the entire thing. Harry said mildly. Be that as it may, no one helped you once the tasks began, and yet you still managed to come out ahead each time. I was just lucky. Harry tried again, but Crumb wouldn't have any of it. Some of it vast luck, and yes, some of it may have been made to guarantee your success. Yet, no one could have outflown that dragon. None of us spared a second thought for the other hostages under the lake. And none of us would have tried to share the victory. You are a truly great wizard, and I would be honored to call you my friend, Harry Potter. Crumb held out a hand, which Harry took gratefully. Crumb gave a great smile and bowed once again. Should you ever need my help, you need but ask. I shall also be telling my coaches to be watching your progress. Good seekers are hard to find. Crumb gave a wave and made his way to the Durmstrang ship. Harry barely had a moment to reflect on what Crumb had said when he was suddenly engulfed in a strong embrace. He spoke true. Fleur Delacour said as she held Harry tightly. She kissed each of his cheeks before releasing him and holding him at arm's length. Her eyes were shining with tears as she spoke to him. My one regret for this year has been not getting to know you or Cedric better. It was not until I nearly lost my sister that I realized how ridiculous this tournament was, but you reminded me of what was truly important. Family, and friends. I thank you for all you have taught me. Fleur released him, and her sister, Gabrielle took Harry by the arms and kissed him gently upon each cheek. Smiling, the two French women followed their schoolmates to the waiting carriage for their own departure. Harry felt strange as he watched the Bose Batons carriage take to the air, and the Durmstrang ship disappear into the depths of the Black Lake. He had not taken the opportunity to get to know the other champions, and that was what the tournament was supposed to have been about all along. Even though he had won, Harry knew now that no one had been victorious. They had all failed. Harry looked all about him as the Hogwarts students began making their way back into the castle for their last night. A familiar-looking girl in Slytherin robes caught his eye, and gave a small smile. Harry returned the smile with a small nod of his head. Perhaps it was possible to learn from his mistake, 
and reach out to other people. He knew that he now had an opportunity, and he made up his mind to not allow this one to slip through his fingers. Harry started walking towards the girl, whose eyes were beginning to widen, when Ron stepped in his path, with Hermione at his side. What a year, mate. What do you think they'll have in store for us next term? Harry could see Daphne Greengrass disappear into the castle, being swept on by the mass of students trying to return to their dormitories. Everything's going to change, isn't it? Hermione asked worriedly as she stood next to Harry. Harry nodded slowly. Yeah, but that's life isn't it? Harry began to smile for the first time in several days. That's what it's all about isn't it? Very prophetic. Hermione smiled softly. I don't suppose it has to be bad, does it? It is what you make it? Harry said. Hermione gave him a strong embrace. You'll write me over the summer, right? Don't I always? The Hogwarts Express left on time from Hogsmeade Station, and Harry and his friends were tucked into a compartment near the end of the train. Every so often, someone came by to wish them well over the summer. Two of those well-wishers were two people that the trio had never spoken to before. At least not while together. Daphne Greengrass and her best friend, Tracy Davis had come looking for Harry and his friends. Harry smiled when he saw Daphne and was about to ask her to join them when Ron began shouting. What do you snakes want? Ron, don't be rude. Hermione hissed. We just wanted to tell you to have a good summer. Daphne said, wilting a bit under Ron's glare. Thank you. Harry said gently. You can go now. Ron spat, but the two girls just stood there. Hermione kept looking back and forth between Harry and the two Slytherins, a look of inquisitiveness on her face. Harry simply stared at the darker haired of the two girls, a tiny smile tugging at the corners of his mouth. I'll see you next year then the girl said, giving a tiny wave, and she and her friend turned and left. Ron continued staring at the place where they had been, while Harry went back to their chess game. Hermione couldn't stop herself. Why are those girls wishing you a good summer? Harry shrugged, not really wishing to discuss the subject, but now Ron had caught Onid on. Yeah. He growled. It is kind of strange that Slytherins would come here and not try and say something insulting, isn't it? Maybe they understood what the tournament was really about, unlike the rest of us. Well, Hermione got it. Harry sighed. Harry saw the small proud smile appear on Hermione's face, while Ron looked confused. Harry changed the subject before Ron could comment further. I'm a bit surprised. Harry started. I haven't seen a Rita Skeeter exclusive on the end of the tournament. And you won't. Hermione smiled brightly, though there was something maniacal in her eyes that gave Harry and Ron pause. She dug into her bag and pulled out a small jar with a few twigs and leaves and a very fat beetle. I caught her in the act of eavesdropping, or rather bugging. Hermione looked triumphantly as she held out the jar for the boys to inspect. Hermione then went on to explain how she had figured out the wretched reporter was an unregistered animagus, and that was how she had been getting all those exclusives for her articles. I've made her a deal, that she is to not write anything for a whole year, and I'll keep her secret. Hopefully she'll learn to stop writing horrible lies about people. Otherwise, I'll make sure that she gets a long vacation at Azkaban. So clever, Granger drawled a familiar voice. The trio turned to find Draco, Crab, and Goyle standing in the doorway. Get out, Malfoy. Harry said menacingly. Trying not to think about it, are we? Trying to bury the memory. Draco smiled as he taunted Harry. I said, get out. Harry said, rising from his seat. 
Malfoy didn't look frightened, and kept on jeering Harry. I warned you on the day we met, Potter. I warned you not to associate with Rip Raff. Moodbloods and muggle lovers. They're going to be the first to fall now that he's back. Well, maybe the second, seeing as Diggory was the first. Draco began to laugh, but then he suddenly stiffened. Ron, Hermione, and Harry had all drawn their wands. Draco made to draw his own, when there was several bangs and bright lights. Draco and his cronies fell to the floor in a heap, and Fred and George, along with Lee Jordan poked their heads in. We saw these gits heading this way, and figured they were up to something. Fred smiled. With Ron and Harry's help, the Weasley twins rolled the three Slytherins out into the corridor before joining the trio in the compartment, where they indulged in several hands of exploding snap. During the game, the twins told them about the bets made with Ludo Bagman, and all the problems they had trying to collect on that bet. During the story, Harry was struck with an idea. When the train arrived back in London, and everyone began to barking, Harry managed to take Fred and George aside. I want you two to take this, and put it towards your shop. I don't want it, and I know you can put it to good use. The twins tried to refuse, but Harry threatened to dump it in the street. The twins, after several moments of contemplation, finally agreed, and with one final stipulation, Harry handed over the fat sack of galleons. Harry gave hugs to Mrs. Weasley and Hermione, who kissed his cheek before following his Uncle Vernon to the car and making the journey to Privet Drive for what promised to be a very boring summer. Daphne Greengrass finished her packing and closed her trunk. She took a great breath and let it out slowly, as if she were centering herself. She had been anticipating the end of the summer holidays with a mixture of excitement and nervousness. In a few short hours, she was going to try to begin making friends with Harry Potter. She had not spoken to him since that night the previous year when he was still in the hospital. Well, she had tried on the train, but the Weasley boy had made it difficult. Daphne had spent most of her summer trying to figure out the best way to approach Harry again. Tracy Davis, her best friend had visited late in July, and tried to help Daphne think of the best way to strike up conversations with the boy. The problem was all of Tracy's ideas either started or ended with Daphne grabbing Harry and snogging him until they passed out. Daphne, while unopposed to the idea of snogging the boy, felt it might not be the best way to start a friendship, much less anything else. Daphne had begun to wonder if Harry would even still be willing to get to know the Slytherin girl anymore. After all, there had been two months since they'd last spoken, and Daphne had neglected to ask if she could write him during the holiday. She had sought advice from her parents at the start of the holiday. Daphne had felt that her parents' opinion was important. She remembered approaching her mother one afternoon a week after she'd come home. Mum. I need some advice. She had said, her voice shaking with nerves. Her mother was a very striking woman, slim and beautiful, with very dark hair, and sparkling blue eyes. She had a classic figure with a slender hourglass shape, and she was rarely seen without some kind of smile on her gentle face. Of course her mother gave one of Daphne's favorite smiles. It was small the corners of her mouth turning up towards her bright sparkling eyes. It was the knowing smile. The smile her mother got when she already knew what it was she was about to hear. It's about a boy. Daphne continued. Her mother simply continued to smile. I like him, but I don't really know him. I've only talked to him one time. But, I just think he's rather special. Her mother asked. Daphne nodded, her cheeks reddening. Her mother gave a soft laugh, reaching out to take her eldest daughter's hands. I had thought this would happen last year. Mrs. Greengrass said encouragingly. May I ask the name of this boy? 
Daphne looked pensive, wondering what the reaction might be before answering, feeling that honesty was the best course of action. It's Harry Harry Potter. The smile on her mother's face seemed to evaporate. Daphne wondered if she had made a mistake in confiding in her mother now. Mrs. Greengrass gave Daphne's hands a squeeze. When did this happen? She asked. Well, that's why I came to you. It actually hasn't happened. Daphne's mother cocked her head to one side as she looked at her daughter. Daphne sighed, but pushed forward. I started having these feelings sometime in third year. All during this year, I've really wanted to talk to him, and actually managed it, though it wasn't under ideal circumstances. However, I asked him if we might make an effort this coming year again. The thing is, I'm not sure how to get started. Her mother asked, the knowing smile returning to her beautiful face. Daphne nodded. Neither woman said anything for a long time. Daphne found it difficult to look her mother in the eye, and tried to find anything to focus on, the whole time feeling her mother's eyes on her. Why Potter? It isn't because of who he is, is it? Yes. Daphne said, nodding slowly. Oh, Daphne. I must say that I believed you to be more practical than that. I never imagined that you would fall for the fairy tale hero. What? Daphne looked surprised. No, I like Harry for who he is, not who everyone else thinks he is. He's different from what I expected. He's nothing like the stories. He's quiet, for the most part, and he hates all the attention he gets. I mean he really hates it. There's something very special about him, and I'm not saying it's written in the stars or anything, but I'd like to see if at the very least we might be good friends. But you're hoping for more, aren't you? Mrs. Greengrass smiled her knowing smile a little bigger, her eyes sparkling brilliantly. Daphne felt her face burning and was sure her cheeks were glowing. Yet, she could not stop herself from nodding. Well then, you must remember that there is no hurry. Take your time and allow things to develop naturally. You may find as you get to know him that he might not be what you think he is, and then again, it could be better than you ever hoped for. Mrs. Greengrass said. Also, remember that nothing else matters except what the two of you feel. Don't let yourself be swayed by other people's opinions. In the end, the only thing that matters is your feelings for him, and his for you. Understand. Daphne nodded a relieved smile on her face. Her mother then went on to give her a few ideas in how best to start a conversation with the target of her affections. They spent the rest of the afternoon together, until her father arrived home. It was a bit of a surprise when her father came to see her later that evening. Your mother tells me that you've become rather interested in a young man at your school. He said wryly. Daphne felt her cheeks burning as her face colored. She had thought her conversation with her mother had been private, but apparently she thought it fit to inform her father of their daughter's love life. You can wipe that frightened look off your face, young lady. I'm not here to tell you to forget it, or to lock you in a tower. I've come because I'm concerned for your choice. While I think that a match between you and Potter is good, I am worried about the timing, and what fate has in store for the young man. You're talking about what happened before school let out, aren't you? The final task? Daphne asked. Her father nodded, and Daphne felt a heavy weight settle on her stomach. The boy does have something of a reputation for attracting trouble, and before you get defensive, I happen to know that he is not always the cause of it. But you can't deny that he and his friends do seem to get into spots of trouble. My concern is as your father. Your mother and I do not wish to see you getting hurt. I can take care of myself, and I am smart enough to avoid trouble if I can help it. Daphne smiled. I'm sure you can. 
just remember to be careful, and keep your eyes and ears open. You never know when you might stumble upon a valuable piece of information that could help you later on. Daphne had been very surprised at her father's blessing. Jonathan Greengrass was a man who very rarely smiled. Daphne could only remember a dozen or so times that her father had smiled. It wasn't that he was a stern man, in fact, he could be downright immature sometimes. He was warm and caring, and tender with her and her sister, and a very devoted husband as well. Daphne wondered if it was his job that had made him so stony. He never spoke about his job, and all Daphne seemed to be sure of was that he worked within the ministry, along with some other old families. She often overheard conversations her parents had, and had sussed out that her father worked in law, though she was unsure exactly what he did. A few weeks before school started up again, Daphne had overheard another discussion between her parents, which gave her pause. As it had to do with the very boy she was planning to befriend in the coming year. Before a full court. Her father was saying, quite agitated. If Dumbledore hadn't shown up with the squib, he would have been chucked out for sure. Fudge wasn't even going to allow him to speak. It was like the black affair all over again. So you believe his story then? Her mother asked softly. Daphne could hear the tremble in her voice. After today, I think I have little doubt left. The problem is that there are no other signs to back up the story, and Fudge won't investigate. In fact, he's convinced Dumbledore is trying to mount a coup, and take over. How can he think that? Dumbledore keeps refusing the position, he wants nothing to do with running the government. He even seems happier now that he's out of the Wisengamont. I actually heard him say he doesn't care what they do, so long as they don't take him off the chocolate frog cards. Daphne heard her father snort, and desperately wanted to see if he was smiling, but remained hidden just outside the door. Should we be more concerned about Daphne with everything that's going on? Should we tell her it's for the best that she avoid the boy? Her mother asked, her voice dropping. No. Her father said swiftly. I won't be the one to take away her happiness. She has the right to seek it out with whomever she feels she wants. But he's going to be targeted by Fudge and his spy. Indeed. Maybe Daphne can help him avoid confrontations with the new defense teacher. Daphne slipped back to her bedroom after that. That conversation had plagued her mind for the remainder of the summer. She knew without a doubt that what Dumbledore had said to them at the end of term was true. Harry had indeed witnessed the return of Lord Voldemort. On top of that, the Minister of Magic was either too afraid, or too stupid to believe it, and was therefore ignoring it. Choosing to believe the great headmaster was planning on overthrowing the government. She also thought long and hard about what her father had said about there being a new defense teacher, who was also a spy for the minister. A spy whose primary target was going to be Harry. It was a pretty well-known fact that Harry Potter had something of a temper, and if provoked he could land himself in real trouble with the ministry especially as they had already set their sights on him. So perhaps that was her way in. She could start a conversation by warning him that he try to keep his temper in check this year, and let him know what she had heard. And that's what she had decided. As soon as the train got underway that morning, she was going to find him, and warn him. Then, she would hope that they would be able to start up a conversation, and see how things went. Are you ready? Her mother asked as she came downstairs to join her sister and parents. I think so. Daphne tried to smile, but the butterflies dancing in her stomach made it difficult. Then let's be off. And with that, Clan Greengrass began its journey to King's Cross Station for the beginning of the new school term.
Harry Potter stood staring at the backs of his best friends as they began making their way forward through the mass of students towards the front of the train where the other prefects were having their start of school meeting. This would be the first time he'd have to ride the train without either of them. Sighing sullenly, he turned to see if Ginny, Ron's sister would like to find a cabin, only to see her joining a group of fourth years in their compartment. Harry groaned inwardly. It felt like the beginning of the new term was starting to reflect the beginning of his summer holiday, and he didn't like that at all. Dragging his trunk behind him, Harry set off to find a compartment, or someone willing to allow him to join them. Harry started regretting the fact that he didn't have more friends. He wondered if it was all his fault though. Sure, he'd never had any friends before Hogwarts because Dudley had threatened and even beat up a few people who got close to Harry. But once he got to Hogwarts, why hadn't he tried to make more friends after Ron and Hermione? He'd sort of made friends with the other Weasleys. But that was really due to the fact that they were Ron's family. He spent summers with them, so it was hard not to get to know them a bit. Fred and George were really hard not to like on their own. But what about outside the Weasleys, or even Grafender? Sure, he knew most everyone in his class on site, but he wasn't even friendly with most of them. Damn it serious. Harry thought. It was his godfather who'd planted that little seed in his mind about a week before school started. They'd taken a large bag of ferrets up to feed Buckbeak, who Harry thought looked a bit depressed at being chained up in an attic, unable to spread his wings and take to the air whenever he wanted. A look, Harry noted, that seemed to be mirrored on his godfather's face. So tell me, have you heard anything from that lovely young girl who came to see you in the hospital wing? Sirius asked without any preamble. Huh. Harry looked bewildered at the question. Have you written her at all during the summer? Harry's mind had to work a bit hard to figure out what Sirius was talking about, and then it all clicked. The girl who had come to visit him the night before he was released. The very pretty Slytherin girl with the dark brown hair and the dazzling brown eyes. Daphne Greengrass. No I never spoke to her after that night. Well, she did come see me on the train, but I think Ron scared her off. Shame. Syria said meaningfully. What do you mean? Harry asked curiously. Harry, how many friends do you have outside of Ron and Hermione? Real friends I mean, not people you say hello to once in a while. Harry thought about it for a long time. When a few minutes passed in silence, Sirius nodded, smiling sadly. That's what I thought. Have you ever thought about trying to make new friends, or including other people in your little circle? I guess not. There is nothing wrong with having close friends, Harry. Ron and Hermione have been at your side for as long as you've known them. You trust them, and I know how important you value trusting someone. I also know how you feel about people wanting to be your friend because of who you are, and perhaps that's part of why you keep people at a distance. But I don't think that particular young lady wants to be your friend because of your fame. I think she has taken the time to look at the real Harry Potter. I don't know. She's a Slytherin, and they've never been kind, if you take my meaning. Harry shrugged. They aren't all like that. Slytherin is a very tight-knit group of individuals. They are for the most part made up entirely of pure-blood families who all think the same way that Salazar Slytherin thought. They pass that on to their children, who emulate what they've been taught, some of them quite passionately. Malfoy. Harry said bitterly. Exactly. But you can't base your judgment of them based on Malfoy and his lot. Look at me. I came from one of the most well-known dark families ever known. If you did not know me, but knew of my family's reputation, would you lump me in with them as being a dark muggle hater? Harry didn't know how to answer that. 
he simply could not picture his godfather being like a death eater and torturing muggles because he felt they were beneath him. He guessed that was the point to serious question. I don't really know how to answer that. Good. Sirius smiled. That was the point. You can't base your attitude towards an entire group based on individuals. What I'm trying to tell you is that you owe it to yourself to try and make more friends, even if they come from Slytherin House. You're telling me to get to know Daphne Greengrass. Harry smiled. That I am. She may be just like Malfoy, or, she could be the most special person you've ever met. Harry had promised he would take his godfather's advice this year, and try to get to know more people around him. His first opportunity came as he ran into Neville Longbottom, looking rather awkward, as he too was trying to find an empty compartment. Hey Neville. Harry smiled politely at his fellow Grafender. Oh, hi Harry. How was your summer? Dismal. Yours. Not too bad. Neville shrugged. Any luck on finding a compartment? Harry asked. So far, everywhere is full up. Well, come on, I'm sure we can find someone willing to share. The two boys lumbered further towards the back of the train not finding anywhere they could squeeze into until the very last compartment, where a small girl sat reading a magazine. She was thin, with very long dirty blonde hair, and a rather dreamy expression on her face. She looked almost startled when Harry opened the door and asked if they might join her. Harry and Neville heaved their trunks into the overhead rack and sat down to find the strange girl staring at them. She had a necklace made of butterbeer corks and large earrings that looked to Harry like radishes. Her wand was tucked behind her ear for safekeeping. Neither boy could speak under the girl's gaze, and they kept shooting glances back to one another. Finally, the girl spoke, with a very pleasant, almost dreamlike voice. You're Harry Potter. Uh, yeah. Harry stammered. And you're Neville Longbottom. She said, not even moving her head to regard Neville, who nonetheless looked very embarrassed. Aloise Midgen thinks you're dreamy the girl said matter-of-factly. Harry couldn't help himself and snorted. Neville looked sharply at Harry who had turned his sudden fit of laughter into coughing. Aloise Midgen was not a very pretty girl. She had a terrible acne problem, and was very tall for her age. Only one other girl in their year could be said to be more unfortunate looking and that was Millicent Bolstrode of Slytherin. Harry finally managed to get himself under control and asked the girl her name. I'm Luna Lovegood. I'm in Ravenclaw. How do you know Aloise likes Neville? Harry asked. Neville glared at Harry for pushing the topic. I overheard her and Mandy Brocklehurst talking last year. Aloise wanted to ask Neville to the Yule Ball, and I told her that he was going with Ginny Weasley. She's a friend of mine. Really? I don't think I'd ever heard your name before, but then again, I don't know any of Ginny's friends. Harry said. Ginny really enjoyed the Yule Ball with Neville, although Padmapadil did not have a good time at all. Harry felt himself going red now. He knew that Ron had been Padma's date, and it was mostly due to him asking for Parvati's help. This made him feel worse as he'd not been a very good date that night. Harry decided right then that he should apologize to Parvati the first chance he got. Before he could ask any more of Luna, she had hidden herself behind her magazine again. Shrugging, Harry turned to Neville, who still looked quite humiliated. Promise not to mention that to anyone. Neville asked in a hoarse whisper. Why? There are girls who like you. That's nothing to be ashamed of, Neville. I don't want her to be embarrassed, and if Malfoy ever heard about it. That's damn noble of you, N.E.B. You have my word, I won't say anything. What you do over the summer. Worked in my greenhouse mostly. 
Neville smiled. I saw that you had an exciting holiday. Why did you use magic in front of muggles? Harry's mirth melted away. How did you know about it? My gran told me about it. She saw an article in the Daily Prophet. What happened? Harry couldn't fault Neville his curiosity. Had their roles been shifted, Harry imagined he would be quite keen to know why Neville had broken the statute of secrecy. I only did it to save my cousin from Dementors. I don't know why they were there, but there were two of them. If I hadn't, my cousin would have had his soul sucked out. I thought it had to be something like that. I couldn't think of any reason why you would break the law. It just didn't seem right to me. Harry smiled, his mood lightening again. Where is Hermione? Neville asked, a hint of embarrassment in his voice that puzzled Harry a bit. And, Aron. Neville added quickly. They both made prefect. They're up with the other prefects. I imagine if they can, they'll be back sometime, I suppose. Oh. Neville said averting his eyes. You like her. Both boys turned to face the girl, who they'd all but forgotten about. What? Harry asked disbelievingly. He likes her my honey Granger. He stares at her all the time when she's not looking. Harry turned to stare at Neville who became very interested in his shoes at the moment, his face becoming a vivid shade of red. Harry had never any idea that Neville might fancy his best friend. In fact, Harry had been more than sure that Ron had fancied Hermione, even if she herself was unaware of it. But Neville. Harry began to wonder what other secrets Neville kept. He was a very shy person, to be sure, and had a serious lack of self-confidence, which led to him becoming the target for bullies. He was quite forgetful, and always had difficulty in remembering the password to the Grafender common room every year. But Neville was a very loyal person. In their first year, Neville had stood against Harry, Hermione and Ron when he felt they were causing Grafender trouble. He'd also supported Harry all during the last year even when Ron had believed him a liar and cheater. Neville had never wavered in his support of his fellow Gryffindors. Neville was a good person, Harry thought, and Hermione could do far worse. However, Harry realized in that moment, that it was none of his business, and knew that he should not say anything. Thankfully, at that moment, the compartment door opened and Harry's thoughts on Hermione and Neville were shoved quite forcefully from his mind as he set his eyes on a very pretty girl with silky dark brown hair slash. Hello, Harry. Please like and subscribe.